Adhikarna 14. Experience of the Active Merit and Demerit. Sutra 19. Bhogena tvitare kshapayitva sampadyate. Two, but kshapayitva exhausting. Itare the other two, bhogena through experiencing them, sampadyate one merges in Brahman. Translation. But the enlightened man merges in Brahman after exhausting the other two, that is, merit and demerit that have started fruition, by experiencing their results in the present life. It has been said that the virtues and vices that have not begun yielding their results get annihilated through the power of knowledge. But from the texts like he has to tarry so long as the body does not fall, and then he merges in Brahman. Chandogya Upanishad 6, 14, 2. Being brought Brahman, he is merged in Brahman. Brihadaranyaka 4, 4, 6. It is known that the other virtues and vices that have already begun to fructify are exhausted through experiencing the result, and then the aspirant becomes Brahman. Opponent. May it not be that on the analogy of seeing two moons, the dualistic vision will persist even when the body falls, just as much as that vision continues as long as the body lasts, even after full enlightenment? Vedantin. No, since there is no reason for this. That the dualistic vision lasts before the fall of the body is because of the need of exhausting the remaining portion of the result of active virtue and vice through experience. But here, after death, there is no such factor present. Opponent. May not other outstanding virtues and vices produce newer experiences? Vedantin. No, since their seeds are burnt away. For other outstanding results of works can produce a fresh body after the death of the present one only when they have false ignorance to prop them up. But that false ignorance has been burnt away by full enlightenment. Therefore, it is but proper that when the effect already produced wears away, liberation comes inevitably to the man of knowledge. Namaste. So this is the final sutra of the first pada of the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra. And it more or less summarizes the entire pada. But just to make everything clear, I want to go back and go over the whole pada and how it makes sense in the overall flow of Brahma Sutra. Basically, the first two chapters of Brahma Sutra are about the harmony of the scriptures and reconciling all the apparent differences and showing how the scriptures actually present a uniform view of the process of enlightenment or self-realization. The third chapter is about the sadhana, the meditation, based on those views of the scriptures. And the fourth chapter that we're studying now is about the result, the phala, or the fruits. And what is that fruit? Well, that's being discussed in step-by-step -step fashion as we go through the four padas. So the first pada actually begins with a few leftover topics about meditation. And basically the thing about meditation is that it must be done repeatedly actually continuously up till the moment of death. This is very important. Death is the final exam, as it were, of the course of human life. And how we deal with it, how we approach it, and how we experience it is the key to our destiny in the next life. So, Brahma Sutra recommends continuous meditation until death. Well, what does that mean? Aham Brahmasmi. 
I am Brahman. I am conscious, and I am consciousness. And everything else, the phenomena that I perceive, my body and mind, and all of the different concepts and ideas and everything that we've been exposed to, these are all trivial and secondary. Because why? They change our views on life and our understanding of spirituality and so on changes as we go through the stages of self-realization until we reach final enlightenment. Then everything is clear and the knowledge becomes stable. And this is called jnana. Having this Brahma jnana, this stable view of the self, Brahman, as consciousness and nothing else. Imagine a mirror that has nothing in front of it. What will it reflect? Nothing. So similarly, consciousness without any object, without any phenomena to observe, is nothing. Emptiness, shunyata, or sushupti. And this is the goal of meditation. Once we attain that, then we simply have to maintain it up till the moment of death. Now, there's another aspect, too, because Brahman has nirguna and saguna aspects. So what I'm describing so far is the nirguna aspect, but there's also the saguna aspect. Now, most aspirants who attain liberation, attain it into the Saguna Brahman. And now Saguna is variously described as Shakti, Durga, huh? the spiritual world, Brahma Loka, Shiva Loka, Shakti Loka, like that. And what it is, is a place of transcendental pastimes for the liberated souls that lasts until the very end of the created universe. And only then it's destroyed when the entire universe is burnt up by the fire of Shiva and merges back into Brahman, the Nirguna Brahman. So the liberated souls who have still a little bit of concept of individuality, of the separate existence, of an ego, are liberated into Saguna Brahman. And there they have a relationship with Shiva and Shakti that lasts until the end of the universe. So this relationship and these pastimes can be basically anything. And there is a deep science of how these pastimes, how this relationship is revealed and how it is experienced by the aspirants. And this is called rasa tattva. Rasa means juice or the enjoyable thing about, well, anything. But specifically in spiritual life, it means the beautiful, enjoyable, and loving pastimes between the individual soul and God. So God and Goddess, Shiva and Shakti, are present in multifarious forms in the spiritual world. The pure creation, as it's called in Lakshmi Tantra. And... The individual souls have an unlimited variety of relationships with them. And these relationships can even be multiple. That one has a, one type of relationship with one form, let's say Shiva as the father, and also with Durga as the mother. And then they may manifest more forms uh, with which you have relationships as a friend, as a parent, 
or even as a conjugal lover. So it is not that servitude is the only possible relationship with God. Because actually, we are equal in quality with Shiva and Shakti. Uh, the famous poem by Shankaracharya, Shivo hum Shivo hum, means I am Shiva. I am Brahman, aham Brahmasmi. So we are of equal quality with them. They don't make any distinction between themselves and ourselves. So we can have any kind of relationship we want, even if we are apparently superior to them as a father or a mother, and take care of them. And that becomes our service. For example, the worship of the deity. The worship of the deity is a relationship of parenthood. Why? Because we're taking care of them in their deity forms. And this translates in the spiritual world to taking care of them like children. Yeah, Shiva and Shakti can become our children. They can even become our lovers. But this is for those advanced souls who have become completely pure and have no selfish interest, no desire to control, only to love and serve. So this is also known as pure devotional service, or parabhakti. It is also known as anya bhakti, that love of the self, which is non-different from oneself. So these all refer to the state after death, but this pada is about the approach to death, how is that? We should be meditating on these things. I mean, the relationship with God or goddess, the, the rasa, is revealed typically long before the time of death. And one then gets to meditate on that for the balance of the whole life. And finally, we have to be aware that the mind will be extremely disturbed at the time of death. The mind is already disturbed just by the thought of death, because it means giving up the present identity. That identity is material because it's based on the body. It's also temporary for the same reason. But the spiritual identity in relationship with God and goddess is permanent. It does not change even at the time of death. So that is what we have to cling to. That identity has to be developed and made strong, that we can meditate on it at the time of death and not be disturbed. And then, according to Bhagavad Gita and many other scriptures, that becomes our identity after death in the spiritual world in close association with God and Goddess. So this basically is the subject matter of the first pada. And, oh, one more point, that whatever residual karma is due to fructify in this life will be experienced even by the liberated soul. Ramana Maharshi talked about this quite a bit in his talks and lectures, that whatever is happening to the body of a liberated soul is only apparent, huh? because they don't regard the body as their identity. They regard pure consciousness as their identity and that consciousness in relationship with God. That consciousness can become God in those who attain realization of Nirguna Brahman. They don't go to the spiritual world. They don't go anywhere. They just disappear. That was the case with my sannyas guru, Jnana Shakti Swami. At the time of death, he simply disappeared. I couldn't find him anywhere. Finally, I caught up with him, 
He was an expanding sphere of ecstatic light. So that is also a possible destination for those rare souls who realize the highest Nirguna Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>